three, two, one. Hello, ladies and John. Welcome to the Nick and Gabe podcast because we really haven't come up with an actual name for this podcast. Podcast. I'm your host, Gabe, and with me is. Oh boy, this is Nick. We've got a treat for you guys today because we're doing a film discussion, three movies. And because you, Gabe, are the person that selected these and really brought upon this chain of events, why don't you explain what we're watching and why? Talking about chain events, last week, Butterfly, let's... We've been talking about how movies make money for ages, yes, even since college. <laughs> And so we keep going, we keep going, and we keep finding out new things all the time. At one point, I, I stumble upon something called, I'm just going to put it up because I can't remember at this point in time, but it was a website where it goes deep into the profits, like, do movies make or break more often than they used to? And it goes to many different statistics about different movies, giving you a better big picture about how the movie industry is working, why people are doing big uh. bets versus small bets, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And on top of that, in the bibliography, I happen to see the author of those articles mention a book called Fiasco. It was a book written about mm, 2004, 2006, uh, detailing the about 12, 12-ish movies from the 1950s to the 2000s. So pretty much that that, that kind of goes through a big sort because I, I didn't think the early 1900s really splurged on movies. They just did the movies. And so, yeah, referring to the big booms of Hollywood studio films that over the years, the budgets have not changed because we still see like two, three hundred million going into no, no, superhero movies. I will, I will say the budgets have gotten larger, even with inflation. There, Some of them haven't, which is good. Like, I, I know that Star Wars was made for only, what, 200 or 100? Was it 100 or 200? I can't remember, but... The first one? Uh, okay. No, 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 no. The prequels, because I was like, huh. Oh. Uh, uh, not the prequels, yeah. the, the sequels. Oh, shit. Uh, but uh, I was like... ruining it. I know, I know. Uh, Get your facts anyway, straight. How I, do you not have an encyclopedic knowledge on all these pointless factoids, Gabe? Of course, of course. It's, How can you sleep at I'll, night knowing that? I'll commit Sudoku later tonight. Anyway. Okay. Uh, so I see this book called Fiasco. I, I end up getting it from the local library service in this wonderful pandemic season. And so I'm reading it, and throughout the entire thing, I see these 12. Uh, well, technically, it's more than 12 because there's a lot of a mentions to it like um hudson hawk was not a chapter in the book that's one of the movies that we saw and basically i wrote down a bunch of lists a bunch a list of oh all, my all, oh my god what's happening my, my are my, you melting uh my my voice um like again i just woke up are you uh, turning into rick who the fuck is rick I uh, I jotted down all these different things that they mentioned, including the honorable mentions that were not in the chapters <clears throat> of the book. And I grouped them into the different themes. So I ended up writing down the three ones that we had watched throughout the weeks. I watched the first being in the 1980s. We have Howard the Duck. In the early 1991, we have Hudson the Hawk. And... Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> In 1993, uh, Last Action Hero. And okay, Gabe. So because we have already gone on for an hour in this podcast, five minutes as a quick summary, Gabe picked, up, Gabe picked up a book. He usually does not read, so this was a, a planet-aligning phenomenon. It's true. And the book was about famous box office bombs, films that had either lavish budgets or disastrous box office results or both in most cases and it kind of went in depth about both the making of the impact and tried to a little bit of a post-mortem explain why the three movies we're talking about today were not featured in this book this is the result of gabe doing research after the fact looking at similar cases of famous hollywood bombs and this kind of overlapped with the history of the razzies the film awards known for celebrating the worst in movies and all three of these movies were nominated for worst picture now i believe the term allegedly bad movies is more appropriate as we might find out later in this discussion but 
for now. <laughs> Please, Nick. But for tell now, me, Gabe. Tell me how Hudson for now, Hawk Gabe, is actually a cinematic masterpiece. <laughs> hey, we'll get there. We'll get there. But for now, would you <laughs> like to explain your thoughts on the Razzies? So, the Razzies. Uh, pretty much, it was kind of an aside that it's kind of like the Guinness Book of World Records, except a lot more less shoddy. I mean, not less shoddy, more shoddy. Uh, <laughs> you know, everyone think, uh, like looks aside to it. It's like, oh, they did this. Oh, they did that. It's, it's basically, it's basically in 1980, the Razzies were formed in some guy's living room, and that, that was basically it. a bunch of Hollywood insiders yeah. uh, got into it at the same time, and this little uh, shindig that they had in their living room ended up being into a, a little big auditorium party that's taken every year except this year because it was you know uh, quarantine time yeah it started very small in the early 80s was, or yeah early 80s i mean it was basically just a glorified blog post that someone who had worked in the industry had done as an inside joke with his personal friends and then over the years it's kind of evolved and now you can pay to be a member that votes for these awards and i believe there are like thousands of people online that make up the quote-unquote voting body now, the one thing that we can say about the Razzies is that they do have a tendency to be like Hollywood, like with the Oscars, in the sense that they tend to only look at the widely released big budget movies mm -hmm. uh, in, in, instead of like the smaller ones, because like there's no mention of small independent ones like, say, um, Adam Sandler's yeah. uh, Going Overboard or The Room, which came out yeah. in the similar yeah, time bigger span targets. as these movies. Yeah. So... Uh, that's just exactly so you would, obviously movies you would assume movies you would assume are the worst of the worst like the room or birdemic or plan nine from outer space although that was older so but movies of that type yeah. they're nowhere to be found in the Razzies. they go for the biggest targets they can find which leads to some questionable decisions and just in general i feel that they have pretty shitty taste but again not going but again we're not going to go full into this I'm just bringing that out there to say that I'm not biased, or okay, I am and, and biased no, I'm, against the Razzies. I, no, I meant to say because these are not really the worst movies of those here. It's just because a lot of the time you'll you, you might see it as the worst movie of the year if you're in the Razzies, but it is not the worst because there are worse out there. Well, we can get into it when we talk about okay. each individual movie because okay. I think they all represent kind of a different story. Okay, all right, so. How did Gabe you... had watched these a yeah. week ago. <laughs> I watched these this weekend. It is very fresh, but Howard the Duck was the first film that we saw. So it's the one I've had the most time to think about. So I could do the quick summary. I feel like a lot of people know about this movie, especially because of its Marvel connections. And because of that, I don't really need to get into the history of the comics, but Howard the Duck came out in 1986. It was a George Lucas production. He did not direct it, but it was a passion project Produced. that he helped fund it. Produced. He helped fund, yes. I'm not really familiar with the comics of old, but I did read and am a big fan of the Christopher Hastings run from the mid-2010s. I thought that was a good, very good series featuring Howard the Duck. But basically all you need to know is that this is a character who is an alien from a planet that's basically just Earth with ducks. Say the word. There's Nick. really not much more to think about. S say it. the word, Nick. You you know what genre this is. Say the fucking word, Nick. Say it, Nick. Howard, Howard the Cuck. Wrong. Is what, what's the genre? In... Shut up, Gabe. <laughs> this is an isekai film. Yeah. Because Howard the Duck is inexplicably inexplicably thrust from his dimension or his planet. Duck They're, dimension. They kind of are overlapped and brought to Earth. And the movie is. Uh, it's kind of a road trip film. It's a duck out of water story. Hmm. And he kind of just bums around for the first half. But then shit gets real about the halfway mark. Before we get there, I think it'd be more appropriate to talk about this movie in two parts. Because the first impressions definitely count for this film. It makes quite a first impression. You know, something just popped up in my mind. George Lucas executive produced this. In the beginning of the movie... You see a poster of Indiana Jones, but instead it's a duck version and it says breeders. And I just realized that was a nod to George Lucas producing Indiana Jones. 
Except... Well, you're really quite an idiot, Gabe. <laughs> <laughs> I it took you that long it. to realize that ILM did the special effects for both these movies. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. But, but yeah, even more than that, they're like in the diner scene, there are a couple kids that are wearing Star Wars t shirts. Oh, I actually didn't. I didn't recognize that one that happened. That makes sense. There may be even more that we're not aware of, but the, this movie, and I feel it's safe to say all of the movies we've seen have elements of being a fever dream. There's a lot of chaos going on in these productions. Maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but I don't feel that these are quote unquote bad movies that make you feel miserable. These are movies that make you question what you're watching. Huh? Like some of the stuff that's on the stuff that's on the screen is so visceral and defies logic or explanation. And it brings a lot of genuine entertainment value. So let me go over my overall reaction first and then get into the nitty bitty parts of Howard the Duck. So when I was watching this, I ended up almost falling asleep because at parts it was really boring, except it, it was almost the average character gets thrown into world, goes on road trip, meets bad guy, has final confrontation with bad guy, etc., etc. So I made a little presentation, and in that presentation I'd say, what would the Sonic movie end up being <laughs> in the 80s? And because I was noticing so many similarities, just with the plot structure at least, I was like, I've seen this before. I was so enamored with the way that the duck looked. They, they did such a good job. It, it looks uncanny. Looking at the duck sometimes, I like lost myself because that animatronic <laughs> was just so... I don't know. I don't even want to say lifelike, but it was like... It's hyper real. It hyper messes with your mind. Yes. Because, okay, the, the beak looks like a soft, pu a soft puppet. And in spite of that, he has hyper real eyes. Mm. And hyper I mean, it's it's a costume. It's not a visual effect like a stop motion creature or, right. or CGI. This is some young act or, or short actor in a feathered costume. And it looks kind of creepy. But at the same time, it's a real actor inside, so it feels oh. like a living, breathing creature. Oh, oh my god, I just realized something. This actor is basically going through the same thing Darth Vader went through. It's another character, another actor, who is being voiced by another actor. Yeah. It's, yep. it's, it's beautiful. I don't know who voiced Howard the Duck. I don't think but... we really need to know who voiced <laughs> Howard the Duck. So Gabe, I want to talk about the first scene of the movie, which Kino. I would say in a normal film, the first scene might actually have jumped the shark before you even see the title. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, that's not the case because the movie is pure insanity. It is. But, and then going back to an earlier thing you said, I, I agree with the fact that it starts off after that first scene very slow. It's one of the weaker things about the movie. I also uh, shut the movie off halfway to go to sleep, <laughs> but I but I picked Coward. it up the next day. Coward. Well, I, actually, I stopped halfway through, gave it an hour, then we kept watching because uh, we. Mm -hmm. I have to admit, while the beginning is pretty great, uh, before the yeah. uh, the problem is the first hour is kind of like boring setup type deal, right? Fortunately, and it's. This movie did not need to be about two hours long. No, it feels right. like the movie feels like it's wrapping up after like forty-five minutes, yeah. and then a completely unexpected plot thread inter interrupts the movie, and then that becomes the movie. But going back for one moment, the first scene of this film takes place on the Duck Planet. It's Duck the only world. Movie, it's the only scene. It's the only scene where we see Howard in his regular home. It goes through his apartment. There are a lot of very terrible puns related to ducks. Breeders. Like movie posters, you see a TV guide and all this other stuff. He's coming home from his job. He's getting a beer. He opens up the Playboy, flips through the TV, and then his chair starts to shake. Uh... And then for some fucking reason, Howard gets launched out the window, Yeeted. thrust through different apartments. Mm -hmm. A lot of people know about this scene, but one of the apartments he goes through, he happens to go right through a bathtub with a female duck bearing all. And duck it's one of the most shocking true. things I've seen in my life. Every day I just want to see duck tits. Woo 
Now, so uh, Nick, this scene represents the whole film and what is wrong with it. And I think you would agree. Yes. And why it doesn't work. Like I can go on so many tangents right now. Like for one thing, how uh, this film was PG rated, even with that. And um, probably it's with the same idea how Marvel mm -hmm. got away with mutants being mutilated in their comics slash movies because they're not humans. So they can get away yeah. with showing duck tits. Uh, I could also go on the fact that I forgot to mention the idea behind all these three movies isn't just it's based on some detective. It's also based on the idea that they like from their inception, at least that they were all confused whether they were for adults or for kids basically yes i agree i agree and that's why we i made all these three come together not just because their main protagonist is detective or spy type deal mm -hmm. yeah so this is a pg movie it was advertised for kids and it's easy to see how it could appeal for children because it's about a talking duck However, but then the first scene of the film has full frontal nudity and the joke isn't even that she has tits. The joke is that he's going through the bathroom and she doesn't seem to notice. You could have had the same scene with her under a bunch of soap bubbles. The reason why they didn't do that is because they wanted to be edgy. <laughs> this is true. And, and your jaw is dropped. I could imagine a lot of families leaving the theater at this scene. Now, and this is before the title pops up. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, a lot of, like, the impact of this movie has unfortunately been taken away from us because of a certain reviewer, a certain nostalgic reviewer. Uh, that Well, I wouldn't... Stuff. Well, I would say... Because, I wouldn't say that, but yeah. But, no, I mean, let, let's be honest. Like, if we had not seen those reviews, I've probably seen a lot of, like, pre-2010 reviews maybe twice because I, I, that mm -hmm. was the kid I was. A lot of the shock value in a few in I'd say in Howard the Duck and and uh, Last Action Hero, he never did Hudson Hawk because some other uh, reviewer did it yeah. before him. The nostalgia critic yes. made an old review of Howard the Duck, and I agree. If it wasn't for that stuff, then I would have been more shocked, even more shocked by the duck tits. But 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 then again, but I will see those those I will say those videos are so old that almost all the talking points are gone from my memory. Like the second half of this film was basically like watching a new movie. And I don't remember anything about his last action hero but, video. But there is one thing you will remember one thing. Duck tits. Yes. <laughs> that was, but okay, that, let's get that, past that. that. Okay. He's, <laughs> he's getting launched out of the building and while still strapped to a couch, he is being thrown into the solar system. Yes. He's being thrust through the cosmos and as he's going through space and time, a narrator voice speaks to the audience saying that this is basically like the universe is a mysterious place. It is full of intrigue and, and cosmic powers beyond our comprehension. Mm -hmm. And the stories of legend are born from such places beyond the stars. And this is such a story, the story of Howard the Duck. Howard the, title appears, the Duck! The title appears with a parody ripoff of the Stargate sequence from 2001 A Space Odyssey, which is when oh. I shut off the film <laughs> and killed myself. <laughs> now, we have to make tell our audience, this isn't a multiverse theory. He literally is just thrown from fucking another world. Right and now. the explanation they reveal kind of as, well, okay, like halfway through the movie, they reveal that there's this big science experiment. They're working with a huge telescope to communicate with or to send information or just receive images from far off places. But apparently it worked the opposite and it's like a tractor beam and Howard was just very unlucky and they happened to hone in on him and bring him to earth. What a cuck. What, what would you give the two sidekicks of this movie like a rating? Like, Okay. Because you notice that they're very quirky, but there's some things, you know, like the rest of this movie, a little bit off with them. There are three characters that Howard predominantly interacts with. Two of them are in constant battle for being the most annoying influence on the film. <laughs> and the other one, hands down, is the best thing about the movie. True. So we have 
Howard goes to Earth. He meets a random girl who's the front woman of a rock band, a bad '80s uh, hair metal band. Yeah, in the middle of a uh, in the middle of a club. It could have easily been a stripper <laughs> yes. or uh, any type of that, or or you know, a, a go-go dancer girl. It was on a right. pole dancer, but you know, they they decide to keep that part. Of right, PG. played by Leah Thompson from Back to the Future, mm-hmm. and she's playing a very intentionally like dumb airhead girl and she tends to overact a lot she's kind of annoying but she doesn't have a lot of a lot to work with so i don't blame nick, her nick, for everything nick nick lot to work with look i can understand with the script but she's got a fucking midget no, fuck you're not supposed to say that uh, a short a manned duck okay. right in front of her and she doesn't have a lot of she can go off on so many things but let, I'll be honest. The director probably said, "No, stay yeah. to the script. Stay to the script." It's like, you're right. You're right. I think she she did have a lot to work with. The problem is probably the direction. They wanted everything to be over the top, and there was no restraint. What this movie really needed was an everyman character, a straight man. But, and you could argue that's what Howard is, okay. but I would disagree because Howard is fast talking. He's making quips the entire film. He's being very sarcastic. You never get a sense of in-universe danger because the characters don't take anything that's happening seriously. You need, like, if a big monster is coming toward you, they're still just making jokes at it. That's something that you would see in a spoof. It's hard to really care about what's happening with the plot. You're right. I didn't. Thankfully, there's more interesting things in the movie. You're right. But I didn't whatever. With Howard the Duck. <laughs> whatever. The, the weird. One of the weirdest things they do in this film with this character is an unapologetic romance angle between her and the duck. Mm. This isn't something that's teased or implied. It's like, no, they just fall in love in a very sexual way. And he's about to get in bed with her, but then the plot happens. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I mean, pretty much. The implications at the end of the movie are that they hook up. Uh, and well, he has, he even has duck condoms. So he, ha- he has duck condoms. He becomes her manager. And he's also... Uh, right. I'd rather not talk about um, what she d- wanted the corkscrew duck dick looks like, but yeah. Anyway, okay. I-, I will. Okay, add, so uh, that's one character. Uh, oh yes, one character. Tell us okay. about the second. The the goy. the second one who is probably the worst performance in the film is this scientist intern that is the only person crazy enough to really believe at face value what's happening and to try and help Howard get back to his home planet. Now, because I, they think if they can go to this telescope beacon thing and do a Doctor Who reverse of polarity, maybe that could send him back. Now, he's actually, in the beginning, uh, he's in one of the legit jokes that I laughed about, where he decides to barge into this room full of scientists after he, fi- he sees Howard. And he just, yeah. he, he just like, takes a second to realize that uh, I'm not going to fucking say a goddamn thing <laughs> because that's fucking retarded. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was yeah. that was good uh, of the entire movie that was a good one yeah a funny thing this actor is played by tim robbins who in the years after this movie would go on to be acclaimed with stuff like the shawshank redemption and <laughs> shortcuts jacob's ladder he won an oscar for mystic river wait wait, wait at the time he was nobody so he's in howard the duck wait 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 he was the main leader of, in jacob's ladder yeah oh my god <laughs> That's even better. See, it's, Holy it's quite shit. a change, isn't Holy it? Holy shit. Goddamn. Okay. Ah, uh, that, that recontextualized my entire <laughs> thought process on Jacob's Ladder. All right. Sure. So when the reason why these performances are bad is just, it's really just because they're overacting. There's nothing much to it. The, this, the dialogue is really silly. They know what they're doing, and it's clear they're having a fun time doing this stuff. The reason why they're bad is not because of their performances. It's because of the overall tone of the movie. It's a little bit overbearing like because it's, it's just constant irony. This movie was basically supposed to be an animated movie, but because of contractual obligations, uh, that's what, what they send the, <laughs> the IMDb, at least. Uh, they, yes. they ended up having to go with live action, which is why you have a lot of sequences that you would think would be better off not being live action you end up having Howard the Duck with this 
strange animatronics to look like it's a cartoon in real life and i don't think that would be successfully pulled off until fucking roger rabbit who framed roger rabbit uh but the thing is gabe roger rabbit came out first fuck that makes sense actually wait 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 roger right when when did roger rabbit come out like this is 19 that was like i think it was like 84 85 uh you know what that makes sense fuck uh okay Never mind. Okay. Uh, God, that's even stranger. Anyway. Oh, wait, never mind. It was 88. I was right, bitch. Fuck you. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, this really was like like patient zero for these type of movies. God, imagine. Imagine you're trying to. You're trying Unless you, to... Like, you could do a stretch and say E.T., but no. You're, you're tr- Howard is a completely different type of character. Imagine you're trying to, 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 to pitch. Who framed Roger Rabbit? And it's like, okay, fucker, but what happened with Howard the Duck? You you think I'm gonna? It's like, no, this time we're actually gonna do the animated part. It's like, "Mm, mm, uh, maybe. Uh, Who knows? They uh, didn't need to pitch because Spielberg was all on board from the beginning. But uh, if he wasn't, yeah, you'd have a very hard time when Howard the Duck is the closest thing. Wait, was Spielberg the one that uh, produced it? I assume he. He produced it. Okay, that so makes that sense. explains why they were able to make a movie like this with such a budget and all the creative control. Okay, so let's go. Uh, enough of the tangent. Let's go on to enough of the tangent. The let's third. go to the meat Bam! of the film. Fucking <clears throat> type character who always did that with his voice. So the best thing about the film, by far, is Doctor Jenning, a character played by famous child predator jeffrey jones oh oh god who is basically who is basically a normal scientist who is in charge of the whole telescope experiment he tries it comically as howard and the crew arrive to send howard home they off screen had attempted to do it again but instead have tracked this horrible demonic presence from a far off galaxy yeah. and accidentally brought him to earth who has now possessed the body of this doctor. And he goes through the evolution from a normal person to a demonic overlord. And it is such a hilarious and insane performance. This is Nicolas Cage tier. The the thing is, when he gets possessed... He's like, he starts sweating, starts getting red skin. He's like, I, he, I, I he don't sweats. feel, I don't feel so good. I, I, I don't feel like myself. Something's in me. And then his, he, the entire rest of this his form is, is him talking in this gurgly <laughs> voice. Like, I will not let you. I am Zenitz from Dimension X. Something like that. That's pretty accurate. <laughs> he does like... sweat in every shot. <laughs> Feels and so- he has this really funny comical mustache. That's just the actor's real mustache, but with that voice, it makes it even funnier. I mean, he that guy had to be so like uncomfortable every time he was on screen because he had so much prosthetics. <laughs> he yeah. had to look like he was sweating. He had to talk in that little voice like this. All yes, the time. he even starts growing scales uh, that was... out of his back. Now, was this the same actor that was in the remake of? Uh, invasion of the body snatchers. Sma- sna- 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 <laughs> invasion of the body snatchers. Because no, he, I think he, he I believe you're thinking of, of yeah, you're thinking of Donald Sutherland. Mm. But they they do look, they have similar hairstyles mm. and a mustache. Okay. So I think that's where the confusion is. Because but it, no, this character <laughs> he's basically fully possessed at this point. He is attempting to bring the rest of his demon overlord friends with him which is why he needs the technology that Howard, like Howard MacGuffin. has a key. MacGuffin. Yeah, he has he has a MacGuffin key that will power the, the telescope. And that's why he needs to find Howard. But, before, but also this guy has some powers and he does Street Fighter moves. But before all that, before he can complete his mission, he ends up being abducted by Howard the Duck and girl sidekick. And they end up going... It may as well be a Waffle House because they mentioned there there are fights there all the time. And so, what is it? Uh, the scientist possessed doctor is convinced by the girl side chick to help Power, who is being lynched by the mob and is probably going to be turned into a duck. I, I don't. I've never. Mm-hmm. I've never heard a Waffle House serve duck before. That must be terrifying. Yeah, 
So this is where the sonic similarities are probably the closest because there's a literal bar fight sequence that pretty much say, serves the same purpose. But the big difference is that in Howard the Duck, all these random people in the bar just want to kill Howard for no reason. They pick him up and try to behead him. And he didn't even do anything. They just don't like the fact he's a duck. And so a girl convinces the possessed man to go ahead and help Howard because he's got the code key. And he just starts using telekinesis to fuck with the entire diner. Everyone runs away. And he uses electricity to scare them and whatnot. And basically uh, steals the key, steals the girl, and uh, leaves Howard for death. That's basically it. Am I missing anything? That's basically it. No, that's basically it. So he's bringing the girl back to the telescope as bait? No, it's because they need a host. And rather than bring all the demons into the same body he's currently using, he wants to use a different body for a some reason. female. Whatever. They didn't think about it that much. I know, but he... And then, meanwhile, <laughs> and then meanwhile, Howard and Tim Robbins are trying to get there in time. No. And this also has a very strange scene where <laughs> the doctor says that he needs more energy because the body he's in is not strong enough. So first, a horror movie tentacle comes out of his mouth and into an electrical socket. And then that's still not enough. So he goes into a nuclear reactor and he walks through a door, <laughs> which apparently leads to the inside of the nuclear core. I may not be a nuclear physicist. <laughs> I only watched the Chernobyl miniseries, but I'm pretty sure you can't just open a door and walk into an active nuclear core. But he does, and he comes out completely radioactive. So I assume everybody in the film who interacts with him is dead. Like, they're going to die a painful radioactive sickness-related death. Right. Ignoring that, but they Nick, eventually let's talk about, meet up. Let's, let, no, let's, let's talk about... There are two ones in the film, the scenes in the film, we should talk about. One is okay. when he's stuck at a police stop where he's stuck in the line of cars, and he just decides to fucking blow up every car in the, in the film that's in front of him and speed off. That was a pretty good yes. scene. Yes. But I agree. However, I agree. All all of these movies are like clearly big Hollywood productions. They're not cutting any corners. Let's talk about the extended flight scene in this. Was it a, a lawnmower flying device? I mean, you can. It's I, one of the schlockiest parts of the film. Yes, it's when the movie kicks into high gear, it becomes very energetic. Films are energetic. They're Howard and Tom Biskins, Baskins, uh, just are running from the cops. And if you look really closely, you can see when Howard becomes a duck. This is the surreal part. This is the part where I'd say this is a fever dream because you yeah. don't know exactly what and why and how long it's happening. Uh, Howard goes through going through a town to going through a swamp bayou and taking out all, uh, making all the duck hunters like fall off their boats oh like, yeah ha, 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 take that duckers it was like the no he doesn't he doesn't say that he becomes a nazi and he says he looks at the screen and says death to all duck hunters <laughs> and you think i'm joking but he actually does say that i forget that and then he says he says he's doing a kamikaze strike and all this other stuff he he really hates these duck hunters, but I understand. After all that, after all that, we go to the climax of the film, which is Howard confronts Dr. Doom's no, uh, possessed man, but he ends up turning into, I'd say probably the b best stop motion animatronic in uh, in a while, or in the film at least. It, it, I, I didn't expect this to happen because, and I, I don't remember anything. It was fresh in my mind. Hands down, a shocking monster and a genuinely impressive jaw dropping special effect. Mm -hmm. It had to have been stop motion and it looks completely seamless. And the, like, the design is really cool. It looks like a men in black creature. Yeah. Which at that moment, I realized if the film had come out and had more of the tone of men in black where you had a more serious character reacting to all these crazy aliens, I think it would have been better. But uh, it's it's amazing that the film starts off with an impressive special effects of, of 
abductance and then ends <laughs> with another one. I, I would realize like today if we ended up just getting a CG monster, it do doesn't really have the same impact like it, it, uh, as it would with uh, stop motion. Yeah. Which is like, it's like, yeah, for everything you can say about this film, the special effects actually are pretty good. Like it's like going forward. The problem with like good versus bad CGI, like a lot of like stop motion, like when it's done really good, like beats out most mm -hmm. CGI in to begin with. So it feels like when we progress forward in that field, we kind of went back in terms of, you know, soul of, of, of it actually hits the human mind because in that case, because it feels uh, almost it feels in the right realm between uncanny and realistic that I'm actually horrified mm -hmm. by it, you know, yeah. where I, instead of me being horrified by Howard the duck, I'm actually horrified by the monster. <laughs> yes. So uh, take that as you will. Uh, I mean, there you go. It's basically the movie. Yeah. They defeat him and then they have a little rock concert. Yeah. Oh, and the possessed scientist man is perfectly fine. Oh yeah. Well, he'll die radioactive poisoning but <laughs> okay. he's fine yes he's back to normal yes. now and nick, he'll go and he's a yeah okay nick would you ever watch this movie again you know what i kind of would watch this movie again because even though it's it fails miserably at trying to be an 80s sci-fi family comedy it actually kind of has the vibe of a marvel comic pretty well at least for a howard the duck thing i mean he's even though I wish there was a more serious character, that kind of is how Howard is in the comics. He's he doesn't really take these aliens, or he he tries not to show fear. He always jokes in their face. They're always these eldritch abominations, and for some reason, he just always gets the ladies. All those things happen in this film. It's unfortunately a pretty accurate adaptation. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't watch it uh, mm -hmm. mostly because. Uh... I liked watching the first part. I would get bored if I ended up watching it again because I don't know. Even with the even with the one doctor character though. Yeah, because uh, while he is good, it's better to just look at a YouTube clip uh, just to see him because it's like I would get bored in that first hour and it put me off and all that other shit. So yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I guess what it is. the other the other thing I think this movie has going for it is it has the '80s aesthetic down. Oh yeah, and in a time capsule sense. I really liked the music in the movie. Howard I mean, the Duck. There's Howard a lot of weird 80s. The duck. You know, a lot of 80s tracks played over a man in a duck suit walking down a raining street. There's something inherently funny about that. My last And then even the theme song at the very end is kind of catchy. Okay, so my last question uh, is mm -hmm. it's a three parter. What would change oh boy. if uh, this movie was called uh, Howard the Cuck? It would, I think it'd be the same because Howard's cucked by the universe itself in this film. Okay, okay, so it's not the characters that would cuck him; it would be the universe. Okay, and now right, here's, so here's here's another question: If Howard was just a, a small person, that, like in a small person world, and then he sekied into the regular person world, what would you think would change? <laughs> if anything like, so like a reverse howard the duck no 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 as in like it's a small person world where everyone is like three foot oh and and then he goes into our world where everyone is regular foot. <laughs> <sighs> Do you okay think, gabe what what would what, what, uh, uh here's a question would that diner scene take uh would be any different like, like instead of it, them being a duck they're going to attack him for another reason or the same reason <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, next question. Uh, canceled. Anyway, uh, the last one is, do you think a good porn name for this movie would have been Howard the Suck? Oh, my God. And that would be the end of my questions. Now. Okay. Well, um, before you do that, just the last thing I'd say, two, um, I'm looking at the Razzies for that year. This did win the worst picture, which I think is kind of fair. I haven't seen all the other films that came out this year, but I could see a future, or I could I could picture this being the worst movie that came out that year. Uh, it has some charm in a schlocky way, but on an objective level, it's just awful. Yeah, yeah. Uh. Um, the only acting performance nominated is 
Tim Robbins for Worst Supporting Actor, yeah. which I feel is fair. Yeah. I'm surprised they didn't nominate Jeffrey Jones for the for the for the Mad Scientist Demon Overload. That would have been a poor decision because he's one of the best things about the movie. Yeah, a poor, but a poor decision because you, wanna, you, you were you, was it right? You, you were you were expecting them because they are hacks at times, and we a poor decision on them. But because they didn't, that's why you didn't expect it. Uh, but then here's where the hackery shows <laughs> did not win best or uh, worst director and it won worst special effects. I mean, I guess, for which the, is the really, duck. it's really dumb. It's, I mean, they, they gave it because of how the duck looks, which I mean, is a costume. I mean, but compared to all what? the special effects, like the, the monsters and all like the, like the explosions and the laser shooting out, that's genuinely good special effects yeah but you have to realize that the razzies seem to like single out particular like things in films instead of like the overall type deal things in film yeah like at times like when they do actors they end up showing uh like two specific actors in the entire film or a specific sequence in a film etc etc so it's not like overall type deal yeah i'm just i'm just bringing this stuff up for yeah historical relevancy i guess it's kind of like the mummy 2 was a great film it's just that the ending dwayne the rock johnson scorpion monster looked like shit despite okay. all the cgi being pretty fucking great otherwise oh yeah the special effects yeah. were good okay besides those moments okay so on to hudson the hawk another hudson it's another... hudson hawk gave okay it's his name okay fine no that's his nickname bitch so don't give me that. Uh, Shut up. Do I, you want to talk about the plot of Hudson Hawk? Because I, this is a movie I feel most people would not know of. It has not really uh, carried on in the public consciousness. There's no cult following behind it. It really is a stinker. Notice that there is a nice similarity between Howard the Duck and Hudson the Hawk. They both start yeah. with an H and they both have an animal name in it. And you can also make both names sound like they're very sexual because you have hudson cock oh, okay and howard the suck gotcha now nick uh before we actually go into the movie i have to ask you watch this movie late at midnight how i watched how, this movie last night after midnight and how was that experience uh, watching it after midnight it was like a waking nightmare <laughs> a waking nightmare um <laughs> i could not tell what was real and un and and what was the movie? Now, it, well, when I <laughs> when I started this uh, by myself, it was a little surreal. Like it, I watched it at a regular time, and it was still surreal trying to watch through it. Like I was mm -hmm. trying to stomach like through a lot of it because the the amount of gasp size I went through was it was it, this was the easiest movie to get through for me because of mm -hmm. like how it kept me going to the reactions it was giving me. But in terms of, like, if I was to legitimately watch this film, it would have been the most boring film if I had taken it like an actual movie. But because I took it as so bad it's good, it, it just kept hitting me and hitting me with, like, this awkward, like, delivery plotline solutions. No, this is the only movie that Bruce Willis has ever really screenwrited. And he had another screenwriter uh, to help him with, but it was mostly for the songs songs he does with his sidekick so it's it's a very strange hodgepod uh parody but let's yeah. try to talk about the movie in okay. general okay because we can talk about we'll talk about individual moments but because it's hard unlike, to it's hard to talk yeah. about the like remember the plot to hudson hawk because of how yeah that's that's why i wanted to bring up because hudson hawk unlike howard the duck has a very easy like simple premise to it but it starts willis, off really well, fucking I'll, strange well gabe gabe i'll get to that bruce willis <laughs> plays a new york cat burglar he's just being released from prison and he's going right back to work he has danny elliot aiello from do the right thing nick, playing his nick nick you've already his partner in crime nick you've already fucked up the plot Shut up. of the film you've already fucked up the. i'm not the talking film. about the plot uh. i'm talking about the premise <laughs> go ahead just let me, please, give me, give me a chance. Fine, fine, I'll give you a chance. Give me a chance. So, Hudson Hawk is about Bruce Willis as a New York burglar. 
who is taken hostage by a large ensemble of global supervillains who are all working for different motives in order to get him to steal valuable artifacts because they contain pieces to a machine built by Leonardo da Vinci that can turn lead into gold. Now, what do you think? Is that an accurate summary of the premise? Now, the while the premise, the way you explained it was shit, because you, <sighs> when, if you, if you're, you, imagine. You're, you're a moron, Gabe. No, N Nick, imagine. You're, you're a moron. You're, My summary you're living. was set up Nick to explain that the actual plot is so convoluted that there's no way you could possibly understand what is happening. Number one, beyond that simple premise. Nick, you fool, you retard, you 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 lovable scamp. If you're 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 living in <laughs> you're, you're you're living in 1991, you see uh, a movie theater. You just came out of another movie theater, and you think you're going to skip another movie theater in order to see how Hudson Hawk. You have no yes. idea what it is, but it's about to start. You go in, and you're watching the title sequence. It's strange because the the poster showed it, it's uh, it's Bruce Willis. It looks like a fun action movie, but yeah, when you he go wears into a movie, fedora, but it, he kind of wears it pretty good. But but when you go into the movie theater, it's strange because all you're seeing is this like medieval thing, and you realize that it, it, it's a medieval uh, factory where uh, Leonardo da Vinci is making all his different things. There's no, mm -hmm. there's no mention of an action hero. There's no sign of Bruce Willis. It is Italy in the 1500s with Leonardo da Vinci. And he's just working on all his great inventions with all these different workers. He's working on... He's just about to finish the Mona Lisa. He, I believe he's working on the Philosopher's Stone, which is... He does all this at the same... Like in one moment to each other in the yeah. same scene. He goes from painting the Mona Lisa and then he turns a corner and he invents a flying machine. In and the same scene, and then he turns another corner. He's like building the star. Uh, uh, that's the MacGuffin of the film. The that's star. the MacGuffin. The, 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 it's it's basically philosopher's stone things that turn everything else into gold. But you so, would uh, you would never yes. understand this is a cat burglar because what happens is they he the Da Vinci ends up uh, pushing some poor intern off his high rise <laughs> high rise castle Does with da his Vinci flying have machine. Interns? I guess so. And that that flying machine that runs amok into the Italian airspace then turns into a hawk over the prison that we zoom down into, where Hudson the Hawk. I mean Hudson Hawk. It was a transition. It's a transition. It was like, but you it was have... like the editing transition in two thousand one, where it edits between thousands of years, but, but instead it goes from one goon to another goon. Now this is why I was saying you were explaining it wrong because you weren't understanding how convoluted it is because. If you're going right into the theater, this is already convoluted trying to make the yes. Leonardo da Vinci uh, hotel of factory inventions and then going right down to Hudson Hawk. That no, I, I agree 100%. The first scene is terrible and like for several reasons, but it just gets you, it creates a sense of overwhelming confusion in the audience. <laughs> and that's how you start the film. So it, it doesn't... <laughs> So it's very unfair, but or no, it's it's very fair to just like be off put by the movie immediately. There, there's a few things you could go over, but I want to start off with just the plot. He's pretty much strong armed into doing another cat burglary job, and the the first thing you really yeah. notice about this film, first off, it kind of goes on this uh, Ocean's Eleven tangent when he's trying to go to uh, one building to the next, uh, lifesaver. A, a, a lifesaver rope and on top of that mm -hmm. it ends up turning into a musical you'll notice this throughout most of the film where he and his buddy des yeah. decide to just sing out aloud because they're so good they end up singing aloud their their wonderful musicals in uh these skits yeah, yeah see like the thing is they're they're so experienced at being burglars yes. that they have several songs memorized because they also know exactly how long each song is, like running time on their iTunes playlist. <laughs> no, no, no. So on all their they Walkman, have to say on their Walkman. Playlist. On their Walkman. So okay. all they have to do is say the name of a song, and they know. Okay, we need to be in and out in exactly three minutes fourteen seconds. You know, some of the stuff in the film is pretty creative. Like that's one example. It was. I think that it starts off a little slow, but you can see the potential. 
And oh boy, when we reach that auction scene, oh. is that potential reached or what? God, I, I keep on forgetting all these parts in the film See, because it keeps fucking so, okay. hitting me. So Gabe, Howard the Duck starts off a little slow. And then when we get to the crazy demon who possesses a scientist, it kind of explodes figuratively. Mm. In Hudson Hawk, the tonal shift changes with a literal explosion. The moment that a seemingly inconspicuous auction oh, yeah. ends with the person throwing down his ballot to say sold, the ballot explodes <laughs> and we cut to an insert shot of a man's head exploding. From that moment on, the film is never the same. I don't know. I, I, I felt that way throughout the entire film, to be honest, but maybe it's just r forgotten memory because it, it really did feel like a fever dream that I just forgot. It did. But, but All these because, things but because, just happen. But because you've seen it more recently, you, Maybe. you would end up remembering a lot more than I do. Well, it's because this is the same scene where the two most memorable characters in the film also appear. The two Mayflower siblings, right. played by Sandra Bernhard and Richard E. Grant, mm -hmm. who I think might be the most overactive performance I've ever seen in a movie. Oh, God. I think this is the most over-the-top thing ever put on film. Yeah. I mean, Richard Grant, he's an Oscar nominated actor. He's a good actor. And only a good actor can be this over the top. <laughs> he, because it, like, it, you, it's actually pretty impressive. Like, <laughs> there's a lot of talent behind how awful he is. So, oh my God. I, I mean, God, I mean, the only way we can really go forward with this is trying to remember what happened after the first, um, what well, we have to, yeah, because we... I, like you were, like you said in that very embarrassing and cringeworthy argument we had. Okay, so the first things first, the the weird uh, fever dream. It's kind of really starts off with the strange dialogue, which I want to get on. Uh, I want to speak about later. But then yeah. when he's trying to take his first uh, like cup of joe at his own bar, he he's interrupted when his pretty much his teacup is destroyed by a silenced pistol from right. uh, a, a mobster. And this is like in plain public. Like no one really even knows or gives a shit about yeah. uh, a, a firearm mm -hmm. being taken off. He goes to uh, see who it is. It's these Italian mobsters. Uh, who, I can't even say they're parody. They're like a parody beyond parody. They, they're they a parody beyond parody because they're called the Mario Brothers. Yes, there is many. there are two Nintendo references in this movie. Uh, uh, the last line of the film. No, no, no. Like we'll get there. No, no, no. We'll like, like it, that happens also in the beginning of the movie. Yes. But yeah. It beginning and the end. And so it goes to them. He they force him on this. I, I believe on this job to get the wooden horse about the the first musical stealing scene in the movie, which then he uh, Hudson Hawk returns uh, to them. They end mm -hmm. up breaking it for whatever reason in order to get the uh, MacGuffin a, a piece of the MacGuffin. And then they shoot one of the guys, and then they just knock out Bruce Willis. At that point, uh, he sees a broadcast of the actual oh, a replica of it being sold mm -hmm. off for auction. And that's where that whole auction scene happens. Now, I think you'll know what happens at the auction better than I do, because I can still only have It's a little more pieces. fresh. The plot, I think, by design is supposed to be confusing. They're going for the, the type of like surreal comedic convoluted mystery that you would see in stuff like the big Lebowski, where if you actually pay attention to the plot, it's really easy to get lost. But the main point is to just follow the confused main character. Whereas with Hudson, Hudson Hawk, I believe there are like three main people that are trying to push Bruce Willis to go on this, this worldwide heist. There are the, the Mayflower siblings, are entrepreneurial billionaires who in a monologue explain to him that they're just evil and they simply want to rule the world. And that's pretty much verbatim. Mm. So, okay, that makes sense. They want this gold so that they can have total dominance on the global market and spread evil. Then you have the gangs who I think are like, they're holding which will is hostage because they know he's the best of the best and they want him to do stuff for them and they don't want to give him an option. But then you also have the CIA involved and you have a bunch of undercover agents that all use different code names. They're 
few like instances where I forget what the arrangement of events are because this film was all over the fucking place. There mm-hmm. is a famous sequence that they use in the trailer, the beginning of the trailer, where Bruce Willis is hanging on to a stretcher, a rollable stretcher oh, from yeah. the ambulance on the Brooklyn Bridge. But One of the most shocking parts of the film. It, yeah, uh, but at the same time, I forget where that's even placed. I know the Mario Brothers are, are included in that scene. But so I... to give you an example of this tone, so so this happens right after the auction scene. Oh. Bruce Willis is comedically knocked out because at the end of that scene, after everything explodes, a column is about to fall on the love interest played by Andy McDowell. The, and the, Andy that, McDonald. That, that, that chick that chick from uh Seinfeld. Ground. It's not from Seinfeld. You're thinking Eileen. Of Julia Louise Dreyfus. But, this oh. is the girl from Groundhog Day. No? Oh. We can argue about this, but it will end in you but, feeling but, but, but very the, embarrassed. It, it, it's the girl his love interest is the girl from Seinfeld, isn't it? No, those are two different actresses that have the exact same hairstyle. It seems to be your weakness, Gabe. <sighs> Fucking hair is So a... he saves this woman from a falling column. And then out of nowhere, a chandelier falls and knocks him out. So it's like a, a joke. He wakes up in an ambulance on a stretcher, but the people in the ambulance are not medics. They're the mob bosses or the, they're the gangsters and they're trying to kill him. He takes a tray full of live syringes and he launches them into one of the guy's faces. And this is a joke. And then they kick him out of the ambulance but he's hanging on by a bed sheet and then a car drives up next to him and the girls driving it look at him and say hey mister are you going to die and then they just drive off and then he says oh i'm going to die all right and then he like he is going down the speedway on this stretcher and it's not just momentum thrusting him anymore it's like he's accelerating it's very bizarre Uh, and then the scene ends he just like (sighs) the the ambulance fucking explodes and then he goes into this like he just he just crashes into another scene at the docks and then he mm-hmm. runs into the cia and then the film continues the movie is basically just like this it's like and then this happens and then this happens now, which is why i don't think we should go through every scene we should just talk about the best stuff which but, i think okay. is at the ending okay but better now now one of the scenes that we should talk about or at least one of the lines we should talk about is it, and it also goes into the writing of the film. It's when he meets the CIA, all five of them. He meets them individual members, and he's all he's like stuck between them. Yeah, this is after the ambulance. He goes into this and, and, area, and, and you hear uh, and you hear about their about their code names and who they are. If in the auction scene, you see all these uh, different candy bars in the in CIA members. And you think, yeah, they're all eating huh, different candy bars. Huh, this is weird. Why, why is the director, like, showing all these different candy bars? Is this some kind of fucking product placement that I don't know about? This is really awkward. But it turns out that these uh, code names, uh, these code names are based on their candy bars. And that's how they see, uh, that's how they notify each other who they are. So you have Kit Kat, uh... Uh, I'm just coming up with names. Oh, Snickers, Almond Joy, Almond Joy, etc., yeah. etc. Uh, so it's very Butter strange finger. and noxious drink, but it makes sense later. But at the same time, it's like, huh? Bruce was like, you call each other by candy name uh, code names. It's like, yeah, we used to go by uh, STDs. Can you imagine? This is the black lady saying this to him. Uh, can you imagine being called chlamydia for a year? And you, you just like, this is the first time I'm like, huh? A what? Wait, 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 what? <laughs> oh, I'm like, I'm, I'm like, like starstruck. And by at the same time, when she says that fucking phrase, uh, she, she's about to turn away, and but just she just like, oh, she remembers, and like, oh yeah. And then he, she slaps Bruce Willis in the face, and then then walks away. Very like two awkward things based on that made me like double take like i have to like register what the fuck just happened because i feel like yeah this and a couple scenes after is when you start to process this is not an action movie this is a comedy all the posters all the trailers they try to hide this they try to market it as like a diehard movie and then when you see the film it just seems off and you're not sure why and then all these jokes come and you're like oh i get it but at the same time you have to realize nick wow what is with the script? The script is ha- actually has a bunch of weird ass things I would never hear in a regular movie. And then I realized, mm-hmm. number one, this is written by Bruce Willis. I was doing research at the time. 
Number two, a lot of the script was being written at, at the same time as, as as the movie was being shot. And <laughs> so a lot of of the moment improv or just spontaneous yeah. ideas. Yeah, just left it all in. Uh, but it was this it was this this, this this strange writing style that it's not even just quippy dialogue. It's kind of mm-hmm. like the dialogue I might see in like it's like a, the essence in like white men can't jump where the dialogue is so strange. You, you have some sort of attraction to it because it's so I wouldn't say memorable, but, but it makes you so much curious. It ends up making you more engaged into the movie than just yeah. the character saying fuck you or uh, sit your five dollar haircut down that type of thing. yeah it it kind of seems like an anchorman style film where it's an action movie but every time someone speaks is just improv and they took the best take it's very weird and i feel like if this film was made today it would have been a lot better because that tone is more common like Adult Swim style stuff where it's purposely going against what you expect the tone to be. But this is like, it's just kind of confused. It it has the same problem as Howard the Duck, but for the opposite reasons, where the tone is a mismatch of two things that don't work together, unless you're very talented, which is not the case here. But where Howard the Duck was, they tried to make it like it's a kid's movie, but it has all these adult jokes this is something that should be an adult film. It's rated R. There's a lot of horrifically violent stuff. Like I mentioned the part where someone gets a face full of syringes, but they add cartoon sound effects and all these weird childish jokes. Uh, the biggest was it the scenes in the movie that other than the ending, let's say, were Bruce Willis meeting the twin, not the twins, the brother and the sister that are the main villains of the film, I'd say. Mm-hmm. him uh, trying to steal from the Vatican. I think that those were the two big ones, basically, before the ending of the film. Yeah, and they, try to, they try to set this up as a worldwide heist, but they only go to Rome. Yeah. And I think, that's, I think that might be a budget thing. Yeah, it's definitely... Because they, it's, mention, it's, they mention they're going to send him to Paris next. But then in a later scene, they said, oh, we went there off screen and did the work for you. Very convenient. Yeah, um, basically, uh, I noticed with, with a lot of the flops in my book and fiasco, they always ended up going to somewhere near Italy or Sicily or, you know, East European type country in order to save money, basically. In order to... I mean, I don't blame them. Yeah, but it's like why if you have went... If you work in Hollywood and they're giving you free money, you might as well go on vacation. That's <laughs> the whole Adam Sandler trick. Yeah, yeah. Well, here's the, here's the thing, Gabe. We could talk about every individual scene in excruciating detail but and as we continue to talk new scenes that we forgot will pop up. But I don't think we should do that. We'll be here forever. And there's some stuff in this movie that really, like, it's best left as a surprise. Uh, let's go yeah. to the last part of the movie then. Right, I'm going to pull a Gabe for one moment. Okay. There's one scene, which at least for me was the most unexpected part of the whole film. And I'd like to see what you think about it. Okay. So before we get to the ending, which is the true jewel of the movie, there's a short scene where Bruce Willis is in an apartment with the love interest, who at this point we know is actually a secret agent Mm. for the CIA. Mm. And it goes out of the apartment because she's trying to get information from Bruce Willis. And we go outside and see that the rest of the agents who all go by the candy nicknames are waiting outside in a car one of the people says what's taking her so long and then the guy in the back seat says do you want me to rape them and then there's a dramatic wait what when did that happen what did i swear this is what i swear this is what he says i did a double take and had to rewind to make sure i was hearing it correctly and that is what he says what? There's a dramatic pause, and then they just say, here, shut up and read this. And they hand him a copy of Green Eggs and Ham. I, 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 I don't, I don't know. I, I've never, I, 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 it, it must have been so, 
d- desensitized. I must have not listened to it. Maybe it was his accent or that. I ne- don't remember that happening. It's because so much shit happens at all times, firing in all cylinders that you can't even process it and you just have to let it go over you because this film is insanity. It's like Howard the Duck times 10. Ugh. All right. I actually, I actually think this is a better movie than Howard the Duck because some of the stuff is so surreal that it makes you laugh. And a lot of the jokes kind of work. A lot of them don't, though. You know what? Let's just, let's just end up just talking about the jokes that we did like about this movie instead of talking about the story. How about that? When he's okay. in the Vatican taking the tour, he, he's like looking at his like main objective, but then he, he sees this little girl and he, he gets oh, into yeah. a little fit with him and like sticking her his tongue. And he's trying to figure out, hmm, there must be a security trap behind here. And then he gets in the fight with the little girl. But then he sees he's playing with this doll. And it's this perfect edit where he looks at the doll. And, and then he just, like, he t- snatches it from the girl and throws it into the security thing. And it, all the things just throw down. And it's I think that's one of the genuine <laughs> parts in the movie that I yeah. laughed at. Another- they even have an insert shot of the doll being crushed by the bars. Yeah. I mean, another part in the movie, I don't think it's funny, but I I found a similar joke in Meet the Spartans that... that the, the Good same... night, everybody. Okay, bye. You know what? Let's not... I'm, I'll, I'll cut this part out because I don't want to go on that tangent. You're but, leaving it all in, Gabe. Uh, fine. <laughs> but it's when the dog, the evil dog, is chewing yes. at uh, Bruce Willis's nuts. It, yeah, it, this worked for me, too. <laughs> uh, it, it, I, I was like, huh, where did I see this before? And I was like... Oh, yeah, it was that shitty parody movie called Meet the Spartans where he's pretty much doing that same thing they did in Casino Royale where, where he's being yes. tortured. Yes, that's exactly what I was thinking the scene reminded me of. <laughs> I was like, God. So the, the, oh, my God. So the, the siblings, they have this fucking rat dog. <laughs> and he keeps, every time they kidnap Bruce Willis, which happens multiple times, they tie him to a chair and this dog just goes straight for the balls. But yeah. Bruce Willis doesn't squint. He tries to hide the pain. I'd say the last villain, the last obstacle of the movie is that fucking dog. With the most That's wonderful true. gif that I'll just put up on the screen. It's actually part of, it's the ultimate payoff to a series of like a domino effect of jokes. Because you've seen this dog going for the nuts, going for the ball several times in the film. Then there's another joke just in the ending where he rescues the girl who's teaming up with Bruce Willis for the ending. And she keeps saying they're, they're kind of doing a parody of a strong female character, which you wouldn't see nowadays where she keeps saying she's going to help him. But then Bruce Willis defeats every villain while she does nothing. So they finally get to this dog. And then like, because it's a dog and it's not really a threat, it's a very tiny dog. He says, okay, now are you going to help me? And she says, sure, I got this. And she goes to attack the dog and the dog starts mauling her face. <laughs> and then and then in this medieval castle, Bruce Willis goes to a tennis ball machine and says, hey, like, go for the balls, dog. And he shoots it out the window. Or no, he shoots it right into the dog and he's propelled into the stratosphere at such a, a fantastic speed that it is instantly killed. Not, not instantly pilled. It falls off the fucking cliff. <laughs> that was no. That was that's for added measure. Uh, I would. Okay. I'd assume that it would get instant whiplash and just become wrecked internally. But then its body is also thrust out the window off of a cliff. I mean, the only other thing that uh, I, I could even mention about this film is when they turn on the device with the MacGuffin, thinking they're about to win. It's when the Oscar-winning actor decides to just hump hump thrust into the air about how excited he is yes. over the fucking victory. This, and and yeah. it's like, what a perfect, what a perfect gift. What a perfect, like, amalgamation of what this movie has become. Okay, so there's, there's another person in the film played by an old actor, James Coburn, who not a lot of people know. I don't even remember what his character is, but he, he's one of these villains as well. Is he, and yeah. they have... They have a fight scene at the end of the film. And I have to say, Gabe, this might be the worst fight scene I've ever seen. Oh, God. Oh, oh. Do you remember the film? Do you remember the scene in Hudson Hawk where for no reason Bruce Willis turns into a bobblehead? You know, 
I, I realize we, we, we keep saying, do you remember? That's the film. Do you remember in Hudson Hawk when the, like every scene is like, do yeah. you remember? It's like, God, I, I can't do you remember. remember. Do you remember the first shot of the film where it's a storybook and then Shrek's hand comes to open the cover? <laughs> Do you remember? <laughs> do you remember the ending of the movie where he goes on one knee, he is about to propose to the love interest, but instead says, "Will you play Nintendo with me?" Nick, do you, do you remember the, the time when all three of uh, all three of our protagonists are, are are stuck, like drugged out of their minds, and, and uh, Bruce Willis and uh, that woman? try to kiss each other but it's like the, 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 they're only sticking their tongues out in this really awkward fashion oh it goes my on god for yes seconds. yes uh i hate lit, lit, lit. yeah i hate that do you remember the ending of the film where he finally gets his coffee but then he throws it over his shoulder and it's a freeze frame and it's like it's a commercial ah uh, ah uh. I, you know, I want to stop remembering because <laughs> this is no. this is like reverse m- member berries. Where do you remember? But it only hurts. Do you remember? Do you remember the part of the movie where Bruce Willis gets onto Leonardo da Vinci's flying machine? He flies off of a cliff. He starts screaming, and then they land into an Italian field where they're swarmed by happy Italian children. Stop! <laughs> I, I can't. I, I don't want to remember anymore. Stop! Do you remember the scene in Hudson Cock? Where... There's too much PSTD okay. here. Too much. I think we've said enough about Hudson Cock. We've Hawk. said more than enough. This is the jewel. Of the three movies we've seen, this is the one this that, is, like, this if you only so, see one, make it this one. This is the so bad it's good movie that I could legitimately say, I wouldn't say you enjoy it, but you will experience it. That is what I'll say. And, and the tone, it almost works as a good movie. If they, this is like a good first draft. If they got a better director to turn this into something no, else. No, no, no. A better writer. It would have, it could have been great. A better writer that wasn't just fucking Bruce Willis. Okay. So yeah, wrapping up, going with the Razzies, this one worst picture. I mean, for makes good reason. sense. It was good reason. But, even uh, even if we found yeah. like in a good uh, independent film like The Room, this would still be a good like uh, race to see who is the worst fucking film. Yeah, it did beat out Cool as Ice with Vanilla Ice. Eh, I, I got to see that movie at some fine. point. Anyway, and then Bruce Willis did not win worst actor, mm. but they nominated Richard E. Grant for worst supporting actor, which I don't agree with, but whatever. I mean that's that. Okay. Uh, how do you 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 just finished watching Last Action Hero? Where, yes, when, I just on to Last Action Hero. Uh, how how did you feel after all that? Watching. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Last Action Hero. A lot of people know about this movie. Mm-hmm. 1993 Arnold Schwarzenegger action comedy isekai. There, and there are a lot. Of it was at the time it came out. It did not make a lot of money. It got bad reviews, and it was nominated for Worst Picture at the Razzies. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. I alluded to this at the beginning. I don't get it. I think this is a good movie. It's a unique movie. Would you say that? It's a film that plays around with the fourth wall. It basically does the trope Gwenpool did, where an obsessive fan of the genre, an action movie kid, he's disillusioned with his real life. He has no friends. He thinks the world sucks movies are escapism and he goes to see these Arnold Schwarzenegger action films and then he gets sucked into the movie and in this movie he is the expert and he becomes the buddy in crime and the script was written by Shane Black which I feel the people who John who's listening to this will know Nick. and it makes sense the original and the special effects the special or- effects are great it's like that that one like car thing where they they're in a ravine and then it goes off and then lands on the Brea tar pits. on like a truck. Oh, That's that straight out of Grand Theft Auto. Okay. And just all the jokes. I mean, yes, film's not perfect. It's way too long. It's over two hours. Yeah. This movie overstays its welcome. And similar to Howard the Duck, it gets to a point about 90 minutes through where it feels like it's wrapping up, but then it continues. And I think that hurts the movie. But even if you don't love the movie, or even if you don't think it's a good movie, would you say it's worst picture quality? 
because we can get into this later, but I have a list of movies that came out that year that were not even nominated. Okay, so... Like, you might be shocked. I mean, okay, like I said, this movie was the most competent movie. It's You would have the most uh, unironic enjoyment out of it. Like, the, like I, I, I didn't find myself really enjoying myself. I don't know if there were any movies before that did this type of parody where the kid goes into the thing that he knows so much about movie fan going to movies uh being the expert there uh i don't yeah. know I, I, yeah. there, there have been plenty of others now that have kind of picked yeah there's off like that. there's some stuff in the horror genre scream is almost like that and there's this recent movie called um final girls where they get sucked into a movie but not to this extent i i could start with what i felt about the film but i can also start with why this film has a, pro a troubled production history and how it ultimately ended up hurting the film in okay. a sense. Yeah, go into that. It all starts with Columbia Pictures. Columbia Pictures dealing with a bunch of shit back uh, from the previous head. Uh, at the time, they were being headed by Sony at the same time, so it was kind of a multi-parter. Uh, the new head was coming in, and he wanted to start off with a guaranteed great hit that would have been a sure hit. It ended up uh, thinking, hmm, what could we do? Uh, Arnold, okay, that's good. And then they get this thing from Shane Black, the the original script. Uh, so was this script like floating around for a while? Had it been written like well before the movie was produced? It was it was pretty much average in the sense that it came out like two years before the movie was released. So okay, it was all, all right. right like that. So um, it's made around that time. But the the but the problem with the production is several things. One. They ended up creating a, like a, a structure of yes men where they were all hyping themselves up to believe this was the guaranteed hit that it would be. Like, it okay. went up so badly that there was like just splurging this new amount for blockbusters and thinking that it was going to be a shirt sell. They they expanded the price. You could have said that there were easier things. Like they knew what they needed to do. This was all going to be shot in the L.A. area etc etc so it wouldn't be too much of a cost because they've done this type of shit before problem was arnold was doing his uh other stuff his other requirements that he had to do at the time different acting roles at the same time they ended up trying to do several different uh, rewrites with without shane black so you have uh different things you have different writers coming on to change up the adult and the children aspect of the thing and it ended up having at least like nine different edits with several different writers happening, both big name writers, small name writers. I, I don't think Arnold really had any like uh, writing uh, power in the film. But in the end, while all the was it, all the adult and kid stuff meshed together well, where there wasn't really a tonal whiplash in the final product. A lot of the things, uh, like even Arnold noticed that there wasn't like a really good connection between the kid and Arnold, the Jack Slater character in, in the film. On top of that, uh, what hurt the film was also they decided to have on this uh, uh, point, uh, like a year before, at this uh, summer junction, that th they would release this movie. So it was a set point mm -hmm. and that was pretty cocky to do. And it was also pretty unfortunate because the same weekend or the weekend after that Last Action Hero came out was the same time that Jurassic Park came out, Steven Spielberg's movie. And okay. that kind of like like totally shot down any like second week income that his Last Action Hero would have gotten. Right. And so also with the editing, the shoot ended really like close to release schedule. And that really fucked up, like, the post-process to the point that they had to spend... Yeah, they had to spend $6 million just to deal with the rush of the movie in this matter of three weeks. I can only think of the horror stories that was happening. Uh, and, I, 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 and I also think, that the editing could have really helped a lot of jokes that I would have found, like, funny based on the content of it. But they were just so, like, plain that I, it didn't end up laughing, even though I... Thought I should have. So well, it's on a lot of this. A lot of the stuff that's like intended as humor is more clever. There's no. no moment where some where some amazing feat of slapstick happens. It's all like meta deconstruction, where it's stuff that makes you feel like it's creative. True, 
but I my my doubt is more with the execution and the direction of it than anything, to be honest, because it doesn't feel. I, I could talk about how the, the why this movie was seen as bad by the press because of a bunch of controversies that was happening with yeah. the film, a bunch of other different things. In my general take of the movie, I would say while it is like has everything to it, it didn't feel really like in the 80s like a real Arnold film like in the 80s and 90s Arnold came with a bunch of movies and you can always feel like this genuine sense of soul like yeah but it's not it's genuine, not being that but it's not being that it's more making fun of everything jokes are more meant to make fun of uh like pointing out those jokes instead of really making them funny at least that's how it felt to me when you watch Arnold movies say uh Running Man uh, Call Recall say with you know yeah. all, all even the, like the smaller ones like uh when his daughter gets kidnapped by this mercenary force and he has to kill the mercenary commando. force commando yeah. uh like all these little things i feel like a genuine like connection with arnold i feel sure uh, like i when i watched it with my dad all those years ago i was like wow i i really enjoy arnold films this is like this is like the only actor i could actually like really relate to because he's just really having fun with it but with like uh, Jack Slater, it doesn't like if they had treated um, Jack Slater like more of an Arnold film than rather than mm -hmm. like a schlocky parody of an Arnold film, I think they might have done a better job in that sense. And I might have maybe have joined it better, but who knows? I, I mean, that might have made a better movie, but they that just was not what they were going for at all, yeah. even from the beginning. Right. They purposely made it made him a caricature of himself just so that they could explore all these details about the genre and set up all these jokes and have the kid kind of walk us through all the cliches. Here's my take, because you said a lot. I I, I did like this film. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say it's great, but I'd say it's like a 7 out of 10. And I thought I had a lot of fun watching it. Good. Here's the thing. So the how the movie ended up and how it performed are two different matters. Mm -hmm. The reason why this film uh, was not a success when it came out, I think is less because of the script, because I disagree that the two leads have no chemistry. I thought that the kid and his relationship with this kind of pseudo father figure, Arnold caricature was kind of charming. Mm -hmm. I thought that they built off of each other well and you could tell that they knew the type of movies that they were making fun of. John McTiernan, the director, made some of the best action movies of all time. Die Hard and Predator, Hunt for Red October, etc. And And Shane Black has written some of the best ones, like the Lethal Weapon films. And even after Last Action Hero in the 2000s, explored this meta type of action genre and really capitalized on it with stuff like Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, and the nice guys. So I think that the script kind of does work. It is very overindulgent. It goes on way too long. But the general idea is creative enough to where I don't think it's soulless. I think like there are so many Arnold movies that even came out after this that are just what it's parody. Like no shame. They just have Arnold. They have all the cliches of an action film. The action scenes aren't even that good. What parody action film has genuinely great action scenes that can stack up with some of the best of the real thing. I think this is the case. Mm. I believe the reason why the film performed poorly is because of mostly one, what well, you mentioned, it was a very crowded box office season. I mean, there's a lot you can't help about that, but also it was just too late for a movie like this because the film is a parody. They didn't make that clear up front. And at the time this film came out, Arnold, Stallone, like, Van Damme, the action hero movies of the day, they like they were going away. Their peak was in the 80s, and the early 90s is when they started to decline. And by the time this movie came out, it was pretty much a done deal. However, the film is aware of that, and the film even brings that up. Like, like this kid is like he is the Arnold is the last action hero. This kid is still romanticizing this genre because it's a dying genre. When he goes to the movie theater, nobody else is there except for him. When Arnold talks about how, like, like they'll only let me die if the box office grosses decline, 
the kid just looks at him because he knows that's what's happening. He doesn't want his dreams to die because he's living through these movies. Over the course of the film, he has to really set aside movies from reality and have not just the, the bravery to save Arnold in an action scene, but the bravery to accept that he's growing up and that he has to leave his childish things behind. So I think there's a lot of meat to this movie. I disagree with the script reasons for why it went bad. I think it's more of just the audience was unsure about what they were seeing. Like, uh, because if you just, it looks like it's being advertised as a regular Arnold film. I mean, that makes sense. But one more thing is that, who is this movie for? I mean, it's about a kid. It's kind of a kid's movie. It's a PG-13 action film. There's a lot of violent stuff, but it, it's basically for kids who snuck into R-rated Arnold na- movies because a fan of Arnold action films would be less interested in seeing a spoof about a little kid who is a fanboy. So this kind of fits the page master vibe of like kids seeing, portraying themselves as the surrogate main character who gets to go on this adventure. And like it's not really for anybody except for people that can remember what it was like to be a kid and be so excited about these awesome action stars when movie stars were still a thing. So it's the Irish man of action movies. Okay. Also because Uh, it's too long. There are several things to bring up. One, there was a troubled press history with Last Action Hero where Columbia Pictures and the press seem to have been rivals with each other. Yeah, in the sense that uh, Columbia Pictures was kind of like halting any bad talk about uh, Last Action Hero. And on top of that, any screenings like of a Last Action Hero that were seen as negative were just uh, exited out. And there was this one particular thing that happened in a mall multiplex that was uh, seen there. Some press guy decided to see that everyone had a bad time and all that. But the thing is, Columbia said that there was no such screening at the place. And they ended up trying to do a cease and desist order Mm -hmm. on this guy. But it ended up being this whole controversy where it ended up uh, muddying the fucking... uh, Muddying the waters with the press. And the press fucking hated it. And that's also, I would assume, why it even became even part of the Razzies. Because of that happening at the time. Because... The Razzies have been known to kind of be in with the press, be on that bandwagon of hate towards movies or companies that do that with the press. And that's the bottom line. And, the and, Razzies were not the only people that picked on Last Action Hero. It's a reflection of the critics at the time, and they. this was a case where they were being completely dishonest because while the film fails to reach the heights of its potential, it is not worst of the year quality. It would not even be in the discussion. The thing about you saying the meta thing, I do agree. Both based on the uh, box office, where people aren't there anymore, it's really just that kid. That could be that would be seen as a meta narrative, especially with VHS, all these things happening at that time, home entertainment uh, exploding with that. But I I would have to disagree about uh, like action heroes. Like I would say the prime during that time is the 80s and I I would agree with that. But the thing is Arnold came right back with True Lies that released the year just after 1994. I can Mm -hmm. also say that I might have seen that movie as it started because my mother saw that happening when they were doing that final uh, jet sequence in Miami. A little bit of birth history, I guess, with that movie. I don't think that, like, like it would have gotten a, a budget, uh, like, it would have made its money back if they had not spent over $100 million on the movie, if they had not just kept splurging all these different things happening at the same time. Like, the production, the, the how they splurged it was so fucking crazy that I think they even spent on advertising they, they were going like Sega levels of fucking stupid with their advertising <laughs> where, where they they decided to put last action hero. I can't remember. It was some t- thing that they threw into space. They rather added a copy of last action hero or a poster for it is a sign for advertising. Basically, they spent a whole lot of shit on that fucking advertising. They spent a whole lot of shit on rewrites trying to make the thing of the film work together. And I do, in, in yeah. the end of the day, think the tonal uh, aspects of the film worked. 
it's just I, I feel like the essential Arnoldness that they were trying to capitalize off of all those great past movies. Like I'm just gonna list off a few from Wikipedia because I don't remember the names of a lot of them. Like uh, Running Man, Commando, uh, Conan. Uh, I think I saw Red Sonia once. Um, Again, don't have that encyclopedia knowledge. Uh, like, no, I'm looking. I'm himself? I'm looking at Wikipedia because I remember all the ones. I think. Uh, there was yeah. uh, Junior, the twins with Danny DeVito. Hey, I, I, that, I know that it came would out. not be one of the good ones, game. but okay. I mean, I enjoyed that. That came after. I know. The, uh, like, all these things I would feel from all those genuine the things from 80s to 90s Arnold. Yeah. I didn't feel the exacts. I did feel sometimes like him when he w- went to, to talk with the mom. I thought that was pretty cute. But but I never Arnold is one of the most charismatic actors of all time. Yeah, but I didn't feel and that charisma. He he is playing a stereotype. He is playing a parody. So there's not a lot of depth he can pull off. I understand. And but, but, it does that hurt the movie? To me, yes. Probably. To probably me, yes. It does. I would agree. That that is the I just don't think that I, I agree that hurts the movie. I just don't think that's enough to completely ruin the movie. Okay, but on top of that, I think there are a lot of jokes in the movie that it's it may have been the first of its time to do so but it's kind of like you go see the best example i can think of i'm like i'm a new grounds animator and i decide to make a parody skit of just pointing out all the different things that would actually happen in real life now while yeah. that might be like hilarious to somebody that first sees it when i look at like different parodies the ones that I have like uh, like mel gibson parodies not mel gibson parodies fuck i mean the 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 the, the who's the, the the funny Jew, man. <laughs> the uh, young Frankenstein wearing sandals. Uh, Gene uh, Wilder. G- no, Mel Brooks. Mel Brooks. The Mel Brooks parodies, where they don't go out and just uh, explain the parodies. They actually try to make a, a funny joke off of them. Uh, airplane, mm-hmm. where they don't have to do it. They they just go with the flow type of deal, where they don't point it out. I find it's, found that to yeah. type funny, but with these like pointing out things. I think that hurts the movie because these are jokes I could find funny, but the execution in both writing, direction, and editing, they, they like pad the impact where I should be punched in the face with funny. Now I just feel like I have uh, kitty gloves punching me in the face. No, I, I do agree about that too. I can't think of any jokes that really stand out. I think of a lot of moments I, I feel are amusing. Like when he goes to the police center and it's like this huge shopping mall. Yeah. with hundreds of police actors and a lot of them are real movie characters yeah. like you see the terminator walk out and you see Sharon Stone from basic instinct and there's even a furry no <laughs> it's a danny devito cat yeah but i can't think of any jokes that really stand out i can think of several action scenes that are memorable and i feel work okay but they work as action scenes they don't work as parodies of action scenes i mean there's some stuff about them that's over the top and you recognize okay they're exaggerating on purpose but they're still exciting. They don't come across as like, okay, this is obviously a comedy scene. They're trying to make it a real action scene. And in that regard, it's different from like a Mel Brooks spoof. I agree. Uh, Young Frankenstein does not have any scenes that are trying to be scary. This is more like Avon and Costello meets Frankenstein where they do have scenes that are trying to be scary. Right. Here, let me just go through the mentions. Like I could, t- let me talk about the jokes I would have found funny for instance, if the exit has been done fine. you ha- There's the sequence where Arnold fell into La Brea tar pits and the kid is trying to <laughs> scare everyone away from the park with a gun. Like that part in itself is hilarious to me at that That part time. is funny, but, but I don't even know if that, if that was an intentional joke. It's not an, I agree it's funny though. It's funny, but I, I wish I could be laughing because that in itself could be fucking hilarious to me, especially mm-hmm. at this point in time. Other things like um, when they actually go into the real world, the set guide into the real world, the the main villain of the movie, he, he ends up killing a guy and checks like uh, L.A. to see if anyone gives a shit about someone dying. Oh. I'm trying to find in my heart to laugh because I know this is funny. Like it's making a meta joke that we don't give mm-hmm. a shit where in a movie area, it's a subversion basically. But I, I just like can't find myself to laugh at that because it's not being there's the execution isn't there basically a good subversion that was happening in the real world was where the villain uh decides that he shoots four shots uh he clicks one 
And uh, Arnold believes that he, because he knows how the real world works, he's going to go. But the villain one ups him and said, "No, nah, I just left the fifth chamber empty," and then shoots him with the sixth one. I thought that yeah. was pretty good. I have two scenes that stick out to me as probably the most memorable to me. One of them I have a question for you about. Sure. So the first scene is similar to what you just described when the villain enters the real world. Mm -hmm. It's a very like gross, disgusting looking run down New York City. Like there are prostitutes everywhere, trash, people getting mugged. He sees a dead body and no police in sound. Mm -hmm. And then he does a little experiment where he shoots someone randomly. Yeah, that's the one. Right. And then he looks at his watch and then he starts like shooting in the air and he starts screaming, I just murdered someone no one comes and that's when he realizes that villains have much more power in the real world but here's the th i think they could have gone even further because i originally thought they're going in a different direction maybe this is a terrible idea and proof that i should not be on a, <laughs> on a story team but when he first goes into the world he's like really repulsed by what he sees like a prostitute comes up to him and he's just like how old are you and then he keeps going down and he sees all this trash he looks, he's shocked by how run down everything is. I thought that that would be a turning point for him and that he would start to switch. They go all the way and then he's, he realizes, my God, like I'm just a comedic supervillain. Like I don't really want to hurt anybody. I just want power because it's what the script says. Like I'm going back to the real world, man. I thought they would have done that. Or maybe he just like, I don't know, like he's intimidated or like he, See, even if he doesn't give up, maybe he even turns into a good guy because he's like, man, like this is not fun. And uh, action should be fun. You should feel excited when you're afraid. Uh, see, Nick, you can't have that because, I mean, it'd be like the rest of the movie. If you thought like that, the movie might have actually taken interesting turns instead yeah, of. Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay. But here's another scene, which I think is the best evidence of the director really elevating the script. All right. And I want to see what you think about it. Go so for it. there's a scene where, okay, so Arnold and the boy go back into the real world to catch the villain. And coincidentally, the real Arnold Schwarzenegger is at a movie premiere. Mm. The villain ah, is yeah. going to shoot Arnold in real life because if the real Arnold is dead, the character Arnold will cease to exist. Right. That's the logic. It makes sense in the movie. Mm. Sure, why not? Who was the most famous celebrity during the Civil War, Gabe? Um, John Wilkes Booth, uh, Abraham Lincoln. Abraham oh. Lincoln. Oh, who was oh. the most famous celebrity of the oh, of yeah. the mid '90s in terms of movie stars? Arnold. Arnold Schwarzenegger. The, it's more than just comparison. yeah. It's more than just parallels because yes, they go to a movie theater, and action hero Arnold is trying to stop a a theater shooting, an assassination on Arnold, and when he scares away the John Wilkes Booth the villain he even escapes the same way by taking an act, by like taking a sword and running onto a balcony like banner mm -hmm. curtain and sliding down it to make his daring escape mm -hmm. just like the famous iconography of Lincoln's assassination i mean that is that is a case of taking a scene that's just like okay arnold stops the gun from going off and really elevating it into something that makes you think and makes you draw comparisons. Right. Like the comparison in real life where uh, a future Abraham Lincoln stopped mm -hmm. John Wilkes Booth from sh shooting his past self. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and like, you, there's another movie, like there's a, there's a Peter Bogdanovich movie from the late 60s called Targets, mm. which does a similar thing where Boris Karloff plays an old horror movie villain who becomes disillusioned by the real horrors like like school shootings and the vietnam war mm. and realizes people aren't afraid of me anymore the climax of that film is when he goes to a movie theater showing one of his old films and a psychopath decides to shoot up the theater mm. and then this old man says enough of this bullshit and he goes to the man and just the presence of him looking so terrifying is is enough to make the the shooter who's just a kid whimper in fear and at that point he's just like you're so pathetic like i was afraid of you it leads you on a very like it's not optimistic it's very downbeat ending but it's kind of thought provoking all right this movie does not do that mm. but it did make me think about the grander themes of okay like 
like maybe action movies of this sense died for a reason because we were just like especially in the Post it's something that could only exist pre 9-11 right. exactly and you mentioned that like true lies came after last action hero sure but they came out one year after this and i would argue that was the final moment of arnold schwarzenegger being a true action hero star and because after days, that the sixth after, day. well, no after that he did junior yeah he did eraser which was a shitty action movie mm -hmm. he did jingle all the way which i think is a better comedy than this one is I, I'm, okay but it's a completely different type batman and robin no i mean yes he was still in action movies but it was never the same and then he, a couple other lesser ones and then he went to politics like and the of genre days, of that Terminator time three, is gone collateral genre the sixth day it was gone people were less interested in seeing arnold schwarzenegger's sylvester stallone gunning down bad guys they're more interested in seeing charismatic smart aleck leads like will smith All right okay let's talk about death <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> Yeah, so death just happens to, uh, when the kid loses the, the ticket. Reaper, when, the, yeah. when the when the kid loses the ticket after the scuffle with the hook man, it goes onto this like indie cinematic type place where they're, they're <laughs> showing classics week, and uh, it's it's Igman Bergman's The Seventh Damn. Seal. So an Igmar Bergman week of programming. So if we assume seven days, that would probably be Seven Seal for sure. We got Persona, Wild Strawberries. Um, they would probably show Fanny and Alexander. For the other two, it's kind of up in the air. They might go for an older one like Virgin Spring, but uh, the, there's more relevant ones that, that had more Oscar potential like Cries and Whispers, so they'd probably show that instead. Number seventh, I don't know. Maybe they had an older print that is like an obscure film, and that was the seventh, that was the seventh one they showed, some like Winter Light. I don't even know what the fuck you were talking about, but okay. Was uh, wait were those all the other movies that were playing? No, I was just being a film geek. Okay, the way I I, I was thinking, I was I was trying to be like Shane Black and go full meta. Where if this was a real Igmar Bergman week, hmm. what would they show for the other days? See, I know more about Igmar Bergman's life than his actual movies because I only have his biography on me. So that's uh... what. He's one of my favorite directors, but every movie he makes is incredibly boring. I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I would say, remember the way I presented to this to you before you saw the movie? Uh, yes, you you showed you showed me this happening, and the scene happens. They're watching the Seventh Seal. The Grim Reaper comes out of the movie theater, and like everyone in the audience is screaming. Would there ever be such a full crowd for the Seventh Seal? I doubt it. But I mean, th there, there there are plenty of weird, uh, weird th things going on. First off, that. I, uh, maybe th this was a joke on 3D when uh, it was happening because that you had uh, the deaf scythe coming out of the screen coming towards the audience and everyone is screaming after that and then <laughs> deaf is literally walking the earth the first person he kills is some cop uh, he walks down Times stand. Square and he just he kills a cop and but then he decides to come to the theater he decides um, to walk in the theater for no reason. The, no, the theater that is not that theater, but the theater that the kid was in, where Arnold is, uh, you know, has a mortal wound, and he's trying to figure a way out how to take him back to the movie in order to save his life. That's the logic. And he well, the logic, the logic is that Arnold has been shot, so the Grim Reaper is going to him. But then when the Grim Reaper gets there, he says, it's not your time yet. What, he didn't know that already? It's not only it's not your time. He came uh, he, there to tell them that. No, no, no. What he the, the kid thinks is that he's going to come after Arnold, but it's actually going back for the kid. But what what he says <laughs> but is no. He tells yeah. But then what okay. he says is I've come for you. What you are a grandpa, and then he just leaves. It's like excuse. Yeah, see, what the fuck does that? Like, what? <laughs> what are... That's what I mean. <laughs> you That's came what just I mean. to made this big deal. They stretched the movie for ten extra minutes just to do this. Just for him to show up, and when he finally gets to the movie theater, he says, I'm not coming for either of you. Then he does a 360 and walks away. <laughs> no, a 180. <laughs> that was a that hey, was a joke from the movie. Fuck. fuck. Oh, fuck. I, I didn't even... Ah, oh, god damn it. I'm Arnold in this case, then. <laughs> Shit. Um, just... But see, that's what I mean. It's like, it's not really a bad movie. It's just not a great movie. Because that's... a hack 
because the real reason, the script reason why the Grim Reaper shows up is to remind them that the ticket they lost that would help him get back into the movie had a second half that was ripped and put into the ticket booth so they can go there and get it. That's the only reason why he shows up for the script reason. A hack would just have like the old guy come down and say, oh, hey, I had the second half the whole time in my in my jacket pocket. Or they just remember that there's a second half for no reason because they were dumbasses and forgot. A, a good, like a true brilliant screenwriter would take this premise of the Grim Reaper and make further commentary on action movies. Because think of how many people Arnold has killed in all of action movies. He's probably a mass murderer on par with Hitler, who is also <laughs> referenced in the film. Uh, was that, when they referenced that, was that social commentary? I, mean, I don't know. But yeah, but I mean, that doesn't happen. But the fact that they had the Grim Reaper at all is something I feel is a step above being a hack. So I have to recognize that. Right. I mean, I have to say, uh, would I watch this movie again? Not really. Uh, I didn't feel like... I didn't have the feelings I did with the other two, which obviously mm-hmm. they were ironic, uh, which would lead me to the whole, uh, what is his name, uh, Christopher Wallace thing about irony and, uh, and yeah. being genuine. But would I watch this one again? Not really. I mean, it has a few good things, like I'd say Hamlet version uh, with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Oh, yeah. Dream, Daydream. We never talked about that. It was pretty I good. I forgot about that. That scene is legendary. That's pretty good. Man. But again, I'd say Doug did ruin uh, a lot of things for me, unfortunately. Like the freshness, the the yeah. first thing. I, I'd hate Sorry, to say man. that. It is what it is, but it, whatever. I will say maybe my enjoyment is because I truly saw this as like a new movie. Yeah. I did not know what to expect. I think it does a lot right. Would I watch it again? Maybe not because it's so long. There's no reason for it to be over two hours. Where I would rather rewatch Howard the Duck or Hudson Hawk because even though they're worse movies, they have more unironic, they have more ironic entertainment value. Right. But I am glad that I saw this film, and I'm happy that I know the truth that its reputation with critics at the time is complete bullshit. Right. Um, overall, thesis about this was between irony and then actually like having a genuine enjoyment of the film. I realized with a lot of these like parodies versus like I mean Howard the Duck was less more of a parody more than just a regular type of movie that just kind of laughed at society mm-hmm. in a sense. I think that irony kind of relies on being gen- the genuine things that we had before, like say Die Hard, like all the Arnold movies. Like once you run out of all those things, it's making fun of. What is there after irony? It's just kind of like an empty feeling if you were raised on irony the only reason irony works is that you have all these genuine feelings towards these movies even if they're bad and schlocky a lot of them really wouldn't say take themselves seriously but they had some actual feeling behind it when you stay with irony it's when it's trying to make fun of something else when you look at it as itself it it looks a lot less substantial than what we feel and I could mention in this current era where in the, let's say, 2010s, a lot of things were based off uh, uh, self-hatred, irony. Right now, it's more about, we talked about this before, that we've had so much irony past like 2016 that there was this new movement of wholesome feelings, loving what what, what we had. and It should have been a movement. There were a few examples. I think there still is. It's just it, th- that they're they're both going on at the same time, and everything is so chaotic as it is. Yeah, it's that it, it, it doesn't have like the 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 biggest uh, impact as uh, we feel like it should have. Yeah, and that's that's a large problem with all three of these films because with Howard the Duck and Hudson Hawk, they were ironic with the entire process. They did not take the time to like really care about what they were doing or what they were saying. Last Action Hero has this a little bit because I feel there is some genuine sincerity, genuine sincerity to a little boy loving movies. Like they took the time to film scenes of him just watching a movie and enjoying it, just like in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. But then when you get into the meat of the movie, it's nothing but ironically making fun of the genre. Yeah. And you could feel that that's a little empty. The best example of this in the movie is when he decides to leave the kid in the car and they have this whole minute sequence of them talking about being left in the car, him dying, 
or it's like instead of like making into a joke they go off to explain Mm -hmm. everything about the joke and this happens a lot of the times throughout the movie instead of (laughs) making a joke out of it and which is why i lead to uh different examples Mm -hmm. like say in the slideshow i gave you can go to actual parody movies, Mel Gibson's, uh, not, fuck yeah, keep, Mel Brooks, Mel Brooks parody <laughs> movies or Airplane. There are also action movies that are so, that take themselves too seriously, but also over the top that they work, like new ones like Hardcore Henry and yep. uh, uh, Shoot 'em Up. Great movies that combine action and comedy that they and just, they, they, they just kind of ascend their whole thing. Yes, um, I guess that's the, that's one thing against Last Action Hero. Even though other movies might not have as big of a budget, there are much better action comedies out there that do similar things. I mean, even Shane Black made The Nice Guys, which I feel is his best movie. And then you have like Martin McDonough with In Bruges, very similar kind of tone, although they go for a more adult angle. But it covers a lot of the same basics and is a much, much better movie. And then you you had a lot of other examples in your, yeah, in your slides uh, as well. Uh, if I go uh, again, you could watch... Showa, uh, both the series and the eight-hour documentary, uh, uh, ten-hour series. Of the course. Series. And then there's uh, the movies they were making fun of, like The Terminator, Die Hard. Like those, those movies are better. The ones that they make fun of are better than what the, uh, what those movies we've just reviewed are. Well, the, obviously, obviously. Like, and maybe I, that, like in the end, I would yeah. rather have these movies than than the movies we just watched basically maybe that means this movie never could have been great because it was always aiming to be just a parody of better movies right i might just go into a whole figure out if the nice guys 21 drum street like if all these different yeah the drum street movies like all all these other things that would have probably been better in that case would have been a better direction for it and then just put the in a movie in a movie type deal well that's why i think the premise is it has a lot of potential. It just like maybe they should have had funnier jokes. Maybe we would have liked it more. Or I maybe don't... they should have gone in a deeper direction. Uh, a more ge- I don't know. Uh, like, uh, like I told you, one of the most genuine things that I found in this movie, despite everything else, when is when he was having a talk with the mom. Yeah. Like, like the when he figures out that what is this? Is this classical music? It sounds wonderful. That that was like that was the genuine Arnold I was fucking looking for throughout this yeah, entire movie. I I agree. They hinted at the character Arnold realizing that and like having culture shock that his life has just been a lie. Like it's scripted and that there's so much more to the world that he's been missing out on. But they don't fully capitalize on it. I will also notice in like a lot of these movies in the, these comedy parody genres they end up having a somewhat competent a strong female character like the, mm-hmm. the mom in last action hero and also the daughter yeah she, she ends up being <laughs> the daughter the daughter of the uh. fake daughter ends up being kind of useful at the same time i didn't even realize but that's actually a good comparison to make because you have the mother and the daughter in the movie you have, they're both strong female characters you, you but all, you have a realistic strong character who cares it who's works hard and cares for her son and is fighting injustice but then you have the hollywood strong character who wears a tank top owns a, mo- a monster truck and has an arsenal of weapons I-, I could make a similar thing with hudson hawk and howard the duck they are useful at some points while they ultimately get uh become the damsel in a sense they try to make the strong female character but ultimately ends up being the damsel it's not as good as Last Action Hero tries to put it, but it is there. It is a common element I see between these movies. Yeah. I mean, shit. The only thing I one I would actually try to rewatch in terms of <laughs> actually I would re- oh, I, know. I would rewatch Last Action Hero just to figure out what would be a better way uh, to edit to make these uh, scenes feel like natural and have the jokes actually work. But mm-hmm. I would see Hudson Hawk again, just to feel, just to understand, just just to experience again the PTSD of what these fucking lines were, what these d- decisions to make this direction is. That execution of the movie it, it is worth studying. It is worth having a video yeah. essay on just to to understand the pacing, the 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 decisions, the all the different effects <laughs> it has to oh, make absolutely. you have a fever dream. To, to, to just 
forget and then to horribly, horribly remember like a horrible shock of what that movie is, basically. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I agree. It's a little it's a little close for me between the best stuff in Howard the Hawk or Howard the Duck <laughs> and all of Hudson Hawk, but I'd give it to Bruce Willis, baby. Bruce, uh, Bruce. The last thing I want to say about Last Action Hero, sure. the last, last, is that your thesis was a bit deeper. You were more reflective on genre tropes, what works, what doesn't work. My thesis was simple. I hated the Razzies going in, and now I hate them even more. I don't give a shit about the Razzies. I just noticed, I noticed them as what they are, just a bunch of friends who uh, got, like, I don't know, 50 more people in their audience yeah. to laugh at shit. And that the fact that they actually get other people from those actual movies to accept their awards now, basically. That, that is literally it. Well, okay. Ni- 1993, Last Action Hero was nominated for Worst Picture, Worst Director, Worst Screenplay, Worst Actor. Right. Got the whole thing. Now, be honest. Don't just be nice for my sake. Do you feel like... You could see a world where, or a timeline where this could make one of the nominees. Like you could say, okay, what, this what, deserves to be nominated. What that last action hero deserved to be one of the nominees? Yeah. The only way in that world I could think of is that if there were no other independent movies or no other, mm-hmm. sh- if there were no other shitty movies, like if there were a very small crowd of shitty movies happening that year that that would probably end being the case what wait, wait, when you say legitimately that means mm-hmm. it, it wasn't on the hate train so the movie is exactly the same except without the bad press behind it is that what well here's talking? here's the answer because i have a list of some of the worst movies for 1993 okay tell me so keep in mind last action hero was nominated for i think like six razzies okay one well, two three four okay fine five, tell me the other movies five five or six and it was on the lineup for worst picture now ignoring indie films these are movies that were eligible that were not nominated at all okay for worst picture okay super mario brothers oh oh, wow okay next teenage mutant ninja turtles 3 wow um god damn i keep going mr nanny with hulk hogan keep going what cop and a half with burt reynolds i don't where he teams up with a five-year-old kid i i i i can only assume i've never heard of that dennis the menace uh uh, i i I remember being okay with that film i can't exactly remember it's more like a harmless kids film but whatever leprechaun uh no no i think that's fine uh in the sense that it's Friday the 13th, part nine, Jason Goes to Hell, where Jason plays a space slug parasite. I actually have never seen or understood what the plot of that movie was. I only know it's the one before Jason X. Yeah, before Jason X. It killed the series. Robocop 3? Uh, I have no idea if that's okay. good or not. Carnosaur, shameless ripoff of Jurassic Park. Oh, uh... I mean, okay. And Surf Ninjas. Surf Ninjas, is that? That that sounds With familiar. Rob Schneider. That sounds familiar. I don't know why. And then what were the actual nominees? Um, A film called Indecent Proposal, okay. which had Robert Redford. It was just a bad rom-com. Okay. Has a 6.0 on IMDb. Mm. You have Sliver which was just kind of a ripoff of Basic Instinct with mm-hmm. Sharon Stone. Cliffhanger, which was just, oh, the Sylvester Stallone film. Oh, I know Cliffhanger, yeah. Body of Evidence with Madonna, mm-hmm. which I guess makes sense. And Last Action Hero. Well, uh, you know, uh, I think I, I've been talking that much for five minutes to say that it was such an easy fucking target to go for. Low-hanging fruit, pretty much. But it's not even that bad. It's not. But the and whole, I know they've made worse decisions, and we said we're not going to get into Razzies. It's, it, it's, it's basically like the same thing with Waterworld. It was had such bad press behind it. I have no idea if it's a bad movie or not, but it had such bad press yeah. behind it that everyone thought it was a major flop, but it actually made some money back. I'm not hearing anybody 
defend Waterworld today, but I you know. can find a lot of people like me that share an enthusiasm for Last Action Hero. I know. Underappreciated at its time, just like Jingle All the Way. Exactly. I, I don't really care for Jingle All the Way. I saw that movie. It didn't really have too much of a care in the world for okay. it. Okay. But does it have the same amount of like charm, Arnold Hemming? I mean, I think there's more charm. Like in Arnold Jean- comes across more charismatic. Yeah, yeah. Arnold is yeah. definitely more charismatic in that film than in uh, Last Action Hero. Okay, that's fair. I mean, other than that, that's that's about it. This is an interesting experiment. I'm glad that we picked three films that were all very energetic and had a lot to talk about. And I do I- not regret watching any of them, uh, which is not always the case. Yeah, true. I'm happy that we were able to exercise. We have now reached our limit of over two hours. I'm still feeling okay with it. And I'm happy that we can talk about these oh so wonderful Hollywood products for over two hours while no one is paying us to do so, just out of our pure love and autism. So ignoring COVID, will current Hollywood ever make products like this again? Yes. With this, um, with this much energy and just completely complete blindness for quality control yes because while a rational person who has read through the history while a producer or there might be a quality control person that would say stop uh uh, such a horrible thing from happening there is in the final uh, phrase of the book and we can always really understand this is that while holly while hollywood could see all of its mistakes and things is that fact that directors may never improve and Hollywood will always make the same mistakes. They will never learn from their mistakes. <laughs> they will always And that's why it. we have that's why we have cats. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. That's why we have the emoji movie. That's why we had Jack and Jill. It's That's it, why we had Fantastic Four. Yeah, it'll, it'll, it, this will keep on going for the century until theaters are again cut downsized cut again pretty much because the whole point of these blockbusters in the 90s ended up creating all these multiplexes (laughs) in these malls who realized they were in a in a bad market later on and a lot of them shut down in the 90s and then in the 2000s and now probably again so while the hollywood industry isn't going to uh pop its bubble the theater complexes who are been closed for months now are probably going to get hit the hardest and probably a lot of ones that don't have like the major influx of customers coming through are going to get fucking cut go kart rink e remember cars e that remember when Uh, i took you in miami and we saw skate kitchen yeah we went to this theater in miami we saw an indie film called skate kitchen uh, basically, that place is going to be turned into a living complex now. Oh, see what I mean? That place used yeah. that that place used to be nothing but a mall for twenty five years. The IMAX. Where do you go for the movies now? There's one nearby that everyone goes to, so we're not really okay. too. But that's where all the indie films went. So, well, yeah. there there were some where <laughs> other indie films went, but that's where most of the indie films went. So, you know. Okay. That stinks. Oh well, it is what it is. Uh, but other than that, uh, that is our podcast. Thank you for listening. I'm your host, Gabe, and with me is... Nick, here to bring you our thoughts on Howard the Cuck, Hudson Cock, and last Ask Chin Hero. And thank you, and come again.